Today's episode is about an inspiring fisherman and his journey. Hi friends, it's Paul Ward here and welcome to Farm Talk. Today we're down at the harbor in Oxnard and our guest is Kevin Brannon with the Real Angler Network. Kevin, welcome to the show. Hey man, thanks for uh, coming on down to the uh, to the harbor to meet with us, man, to give me this opportunity. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. So you wear many, many hats, uh, Real Angler Network, uh, the Real Guppy Fishing Program, uh, Real Radio, and Real Angler Fishing Show. It's a lot, but it's all under the same, they're all symbiotic. Mm -hmm. So Real Angler's Fishing Show, um, I went back to Oxnard College to do a TV fishing show. Mm -hmm. I didn't think California had enough representation in fishing shows uh, that you see on you know cable TV. Right. And um, I worked on both since I was 11, so I wanted like more of an educational feel to my programming mm -hmm. and not to showcase that you needed to be in an exotic location or... You know, you know, needed the most expensive gear, things like that. Florida Keys catching big know, sailfish. Yeah, or Cabo or something like that, right? So, right. but at the time when I was watching it growing up, I thought even Catalina was kind of far, right? Wow, I like that Catalina where I actually live here in the Channel Islands. So I wanted to show that it was more documentary style, mm -hmm. um, California based. And I think I said educational. So growing up, like I love PBS type of shows, like Reading Rainbow was my favorite. So I kind of, like even my first uh, TV show, like we'll see you next time I've installed of our burdens. Like kind of a little catch line from Rainy Rainbow, but that's how I started the Royal Angler Network was taking uh, the, the 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 TV show and starting at Oxnard College, and I got on like Channel Ten, and mm -hmm. um, then what I was able to do was take my platform of fishing. Uh, when I would leave my my house with my kids to go fishing, kids would say, "Hey, what somebody would take me fishing?" Mm -hmm. So we started Real Angler Kid Fishing Days, and we would just kind of do it periodically, and then. I was funding all this out of my own pocket as an exterminator. And this is with your kids and then other families' kids? Uh, yeah. When we first started, it was like my kids. I would take them out. Okay. My kids were the first guppy to help, right? They were my free labor, let's call it that way. Okay. And, you're, and, you're, and you, you're, you call your, your kids guppies because they were helping you. So how we got the name guppy was we would give them a camera to film with. For the kid fishing days, we'd give them a camera uh -huh. and get the perspective from a seven and 10-year-old, right? Right. And we called it the guppy cam. So when we would cut to that camera, when we go to post-production, there'd be a little dot on the bottom that said guppy cam. And that was the one with the kids were filming. So there'd be great questions, the kids asking other kids questions, watching them cut bait. So that's how the term guppy came along. Mm -hmm. Then we went, so we started calling it the guppies, yeah, the kids. And then when we went 501c3 to try to get a little bit of help uh, from it, because again, finding it out of my own pocket, we just kept the name Guppy. So we called mm -hmm. it Real Anglers, Real Guppy, try to keep the real vibe kind of as a branding thing. Mm -hmm. But the word Guppy did come from the Guppy camera that we'd give them to film so that way we could cut that into a Real Anglers episode and show it from their perspective. And so what is the what is the mission of the Real Anglers Network and the and the Real Guppy Outdoor Program? Our mission, we just actually changed our mission this year to, to be concise in one. And it's basically to empower the generation to do, to be impactful in their environment, not the environment, mm -hmm. through the passion that they love. Mm -hmm. I get to be an illustration on what I get to do with my passion. Mm -hmm. Teaching, mm -hmm. I love fishing, I love where I live at, and that's how I serve my community. Mm -hmm. So whatever it is that somebody wants to do in life mm -hmm. as a career versus a job, mm -hmm. that I can be an illustration that you can be impactful in your environment following your dream and your passion. So that's kind of the mission, if you look at like our mission statement, but the mission is to kind of just highlight California and outdoor activity and what we have in our backyard and go out and play and get wet, whether you love a diehard fisherman or you like kicking over rocks at the creek and playing with the insects or you right. like to go to the islands and hike. So again, where we live at to highlight California and showcase what we have in our backyard mm -hmm. was kind of the mission when I first started rolling this fishing show. Again, it wasn't. And the reason that is fishing isn't always about, you know, uh, a demographic man could be. Fishing is commonly known as like a, a white man sport between 18 and 65, right? John right. Smith. Right. When it's really not like that. We have, we're in California. Right. You know, there's different populations out here and maybe some of them love fishing. Maybe women love fishing and the whole experience of being outdoors. I wanted that as the mission, not mm -hmm. just catching a trophy fish in some exotic location, like I said. Right. But the adventure and the fun of the smells and the sun rises. So I really wanted to capture that in my filmmaking right? to make it cinematic. So that way, again, you could see the whole California Gold Coast scenery with the family, with friends, on your own. Mm -hmm. That's kind of when I started. Like, that was what started when I turned the camera on to film episode one. That was the idea. Interesting. Now, you and I were talking before we filmed and, you know, the the stereotype. And I, I grew up with that stereotype, right? My grandfather was the fisherman and he had the big boat and 
I realized not, and when he died, it kind of all went away, right? But if I didn't have my grandfather, because my dad was not in my life, but you would think that the dad would be the one that teaches sons or, or the daughter, right? But not everybody has that opportunity. So that's like a tribal thing, right? Like, mm-hmm. again, you learn to hunt and gather, right? That's right. something that's in our intuition, right? We're hunter- hunters and gatherers, right? And you pass on that tradition, mm-hmm. you know, since the caveman days, we want to go that far back, right? So my story of why I started the Guppy program, I didn't have, my dad overdosed when I was like six years old. I didn't have a dad to take me fishing. Mm-hmm. Some people have dads that have never been fishing. There's different culture and different traditions. So there's a different, uh, it's not a one, one size fits all for everybody. And that's kind of the, the intention of the program. But America itself, I think has changed the landscape of that. Again, single parents or different traditions. I won't go too far in that way. Sure. But not everybody um, has somebody to teach them. Mm-hmm. So again, if we could show, hey, if you, one of the things that I like to uh, showcase when I started my show was for what you pay for a ball game or amusement park, mm-hmm. you could buy a guide or a service, mm-hmm. some sport fishing boats. Mm-hmm. That's where I grew up at, pay 60 bucks at the time. And you go on a boat, they provide the bait, you can rent a rod, they'll show how to use everything. And hey, if the boat's too much, maybe you just go over to the lake, get somebody to teach you how to bass fish or something like that, right? There is a way to spend your disposable income on recreational sport fishing at the level that you could handle. Mm-hmm. The stuff that we do with the guppies primarily is on the pier. You don't need a fishing license, it's just the one-on-one. So that was kind of, again, the basis. In case somebody didn't have somebody that taught them how to fish, mm-hmm. there are people that will show you how because fishing could be very intimidating to walk into a retail store right. and look at all that gear on the wall and not know what to do with it. And you want to, or maybe your dad and your pride's in the way and you say, I don't know how to tie a hook. I can't take my kid fishing. or So you maybe find some other type of recreation. Mm-hmm. So by thinking of all that, working on sport boats since I was a kid, it's kind of how I formulated like how we do it a clinic style through television. Mm-hmm. The real angler slogan was to get more average Joes and Janes out fishing. And we did a series called Average James. I had my friend, one of my best friends, and we start the Guppy program, James, would come along and it showed how he learned how to catch like a basic white fish to finally getting to a yellowtail. And it kind of these chronicle uh, versions of him expanding. And that was kind of the mission, like getting more average Joes and James and his name was James. So it worked out. Right. And we had that to show you don't have to not throw a jig or you don't have to catch these big tuna. You could start here and work your way that direction. Mm-hmm. And then so with the guppy program, and this is probably all based because I worked on sport boats, helping people catch their fish for their first time. Mm-hmm. So seeing how you know, they would get scared trying to hook a bait or hold their rod and do all that to kind of break that barrier down and be like, don't worry, let me just kind of like guide you through this. Right. So all that research and all that, watching people transform on the boat, watching them so excited to catch their first fish is kind of how I incorporated the brand of Rolanger Fishing Show and how we teach that cinematically and then Roke Up the Outdoors on how we serve families and kids from all different walks of life to experience what we have in our backyard. And the real Guppy program has grown. You you started with your own children. You brought in some neighborhood kids. Now you're going in classrooms? Yeah, but that was kind of the idea. Mm-hmm. So to be a teacher, right? So again, going back to the PBS style, mm-hmm. I already wanted to do things, um, make content and deliver that, that PBS style. Mm-hmm. So that vision has been there. It's just a matter of able to get to the capacity that I can make that next step in education. Mm-hmm. You know, I always, when I was a kid, I say, what do you want to do when you grow up? I'd say, I want to be a teacher when I grow up, right? But I had my own learning curves and the way I grew up and the continuation high school I went to and working on boats, like I didn't have academics. Mm-hmm. So I thought, well, um, that's not going to be, you know, I might be a teacher. And then I got into personal training. So I just started to develop a teaching style, right? How do I break all this information? Then I look at it like, well, you were teaching people on the boat. Mm-hmm. You are a teacher. Mm-hmm. You just... This is your classroom. Right. This is your material. The ocean is your classroom. Right. Or just our, you know, yeah, the ocean is my classroom and uh, that's where I get to teach from. So getting into the schools now and watching it grow. And the reason I'm saying this to the viewer is that if you have a vision in your brain of what you want to do, it's going to take those steps. Kind of like fishing, right? How do you bait your hook? How do you learn how to cast? Like there's, and I do a lot of that when I go into schools and teach or teach people how to fish or do entrepreneurial leadership teaching here is there is a process. Mm-hmm. So this, we're me being in the schools right now, it's been part of the vision. It just took a process uh, to finally get to walk on a campus. Teachers and schools that sign up for the program, what does that look like? What do you what do? You do? What do you teach the kids? It, uh, so communitykevin.com kind of gives you an idea. And what I mean by that is that it's like, we talked about it in our millionaires, there's a buffet. What would you like? Do you want me to come to your class and do an assembly? Mm-hmm. Do you want to just meet us at the pier? Mm-hmm. Do you want to come to our learning center? Because now education and teaching isn't all in a public school setting. Mm-hmm. We have had homeschools that have come here. 
we've had groups like the Scouts that show up here. And, so, and, and exactly, where are we? What's, what's... This is the Real Guppy Dockside Learning Center Multimedia Studio. Okay. We're here in the Oxnard um, in the Channel Islands at the Fisherman's Wharf. We got mm-hmm. ourselves a little 900 foot space mm-hmm. and uh, didn't know what we were really going to do. I, I mean, I ran the side of my house for the first 11 years, mm-hmm. right? All the stuff was stuffed in a storage in my backyard and I'd wake up Kevin Jr. and I'd have his buddy stay the night so that I have my little workers on the weekend, mm-hmm. get a couple of friends to come out and help. And that's that's how it was. And then it was really like a, a aha moment. I was working at Channel Island Sport Fishing. I quit exterminating and I was working. I was cleaning the squeegeeing windows and it was like a moment hit me like, don't you want a Dockside Learning Center? And I stepped back from the window. It was like a movie for real. Mm-hmm. And I'm looking in this piercing into this window and I, I said, hey, Bubba, he's a guy I work with. Hey, come check it out, man. What's up with this part of the building right here? Is it doesn't get utilized because Channel Island Sport Fishing is this, you know, right here. But this right. part of the building is just dark and nothing happening. So we drew up a proposal and I uh, asked the landing, hey, could I, can I lease this little area? And they said, well, um, it's, it's kind of this, some of this harbor is falling apart. Mm-hmm. So that part was condemned. They gave it back to the county. So we drew up this little blueprint of what it would look like if we had that building. We ended up getting a grant. And I asked somebody to show me this property or you know any properties around here? We looked at a really big one. We found this one and, uh, and here we are. So we're still learning some of the business aspect of it, Mm -hmm. but the vision and the idea has, has been there. And that's one thing that I, that I, my style of getting into it is sometimes I jump in and kind of figure it out as I go. Mm -hmm. We've had a lot of success again in 13 years that I feel like the risk that we take that I'm willing to take to gamble on myself. And that's mm-hmm. a lot of stuff I teach when I'm into the schools, like mm-hmm. telling kids to follow their dreams and passions mm-hmm. is to is to go in there and uh, and give it a try. You're, some things you're not going to learn unless you get in there and give it a try. Right. And you're not just teaching fishing, you're teaching environmental stewardship, right? Leadership. Right. Um, you've got a, a, a mentoring program. You've got the a ranger program. The Guppy Ranger program. So that's been in my brain since, it's funny because uh, Marshall that works here, has been with me for man, me and Marshall. We, we've been parking lots just us. We didn't even have a banner yet. We had like, I don't even think we had handouts yet. We were at the, I think it was Mothers Against Drug Driving invited us to the Wainimi Library and we're just out there and we had like a couple fishing poles and made some homemade targets and we're just, you know, just in the parking lot because the chief of police asked us to join them, you know, right. to, um, to where we're going now. But the idea is when we used to meet at the local pizza parlor, right? And just trying to, a couple friends, hey, they got this nonprofit because that was when it was more of a, Little League or PTA nonprofit versus a whole business right now, right? And that was in my brain. It's Cuppy Ranger program. I have a video of taking my kids hiking in Newberry Park 10 years ago, and it says Cuppy Rangers are hiking. So this idea, and, and in that video, Kevin Jr. is talking about environmental stewardship, and Jasmine's talking about pack out what you pack in. But I, I kind of got these ideas again from reading Rainbow Man, mm-hmm. when I'd watch little segments that he would do, and he would be hiking like in Arizona, mm-hmm. and then he would go out there and talk about, hey, everything we bring in, we bring out. Mm-hmm. And microorganisms and these different things that live in Florida, and just kind of taking his stuff and piecing it together to my own. Mm-hmm. But that idea of what a Guppy Ranger program would look like, and then going back to the pizza parlor thing and saying, one day we're going to do this to actually, again, the capacity to be able to pull it off here, because we have a facility, we have partnerships that we can utilize for the Guppy Ranger program for this eight week course. We have uh, Harbor Patrol pull up here on a boat, give a full demonstration. So then about um, occupational pathways on the water. Mm-hmm. So to, to kind of orchestrate all that to this eight week course, it's really taken that 10 years, even though it was in my brain to develop and then the partnerships to make sure that this eight week course, you know. So, has- so this would be for kids who want to kind of take it to the next level, right? They do the guppies and they they learn how to fish and then it's like they want to know more. So for this particular, this is our first series mm-hmm. and we wanted to do about seven years old to 15. Okay. But it's a family engagement program. Everything that we do is family engagement. Those kids won't come back to fish again at that derby until the parent brings them again the next year. So by having a family engagement aspect of it, they're more likely to start that tradition on their own. They might go to Walmart or somewhere and get a little $40 set up and then start doing it on their own. So I kind of took that idea of um, the family engagement part with the Scuppy Ranger program. So the, they don't drop them off. Anything mm-hmm. that we do is not a drop-off program. Mm-hmm. So 7 to 15, mm-hmm. parents got to be here, part of it. Mm-hmm. You're, you have to make a commitment to the eight weeks. You can miss about two of the eight weeks. You know, you'll get a little badge when you're done, a little shield, because you can't go into battle of life without, we shall have a shield, right? Right. So there's metaphors that are tied into this. So you have to be a certain age. So that way you have to, if you're a ranger, I was listening to this David Goggins book. I listened about six times. When you're a ranger versus, you know, a regular, somebody in the service, you have different assignments that you have to do. So for this program, I mean, give it to them on the uh, the day we introduce it to them. 
you know, you have to follow, there's these things that are built into it. Mm -hmm. And can you handle that for eight weeks? Because we have other days that we do our fourth Sunday we do for free. So we do a kid fishing day every fourth Sunday for free on the Port Wainemi Pier. We supply all the gear. Maybe that's where you want to hang out at. Mm -hmm. But if you are interested in learning more about what's in our backyard and rangers and jobs, like I don't, I don't, I can't be in a where in, in an office job. I need to be outside. Mm -hmm. So in school, I was a fidgeter moving around. So I know that there's other kids that maybe an outdoor job or career might be where they they're going to thrive at, right? So we, I bring all this in when I think about how we do this program. Mm -hmm. Myself as that kid, when you hear my story, uh, how was I successful? What kind of mentorships did I need? What kind of development did I need? So that's wrapped up into this. So a little bit older kid, so that way they're catching on to it and knowing that there are some assignments that they have to do and the parents had to be willing to participate for the eight weeks. So there is kind of like a, a criteria, an outline, and a, a, a goal with, with the Guppy Ranger program. Yeah, stewardship. Because again, that makes that mission that we talked about, right? We're empowering or or we're developing impactful leaders. So wherever they go, let's say a kid says, hey, I want to go out and be a, a marine biologist in the national park. Well, at least he has recreational fishing knowledge so that they're going to take with them where they go. They're advocating for recreational sport fishing because all else fails. I represent the recreational sport fishing. That's what I'm in. I work on boats since I was a kid. I go to the summits. My business is fishing. California is one of those states where they move around a lot of legislation and move things around and restrictions like fishing seasons. Mm -hmm. So I'm always going to advocate for recreational sport fishing as well. And that's what we teach them. Do we, do you get to take the fish home? Absolutely. Remember that hunter gatherer thing we talked about? Yeah. Well, there is a size limit. There is a fishing season. There are these things that we can do to make sure that we have a sustainable fishery in the Channel Islands. Mm -hmm. So that's based in there too. But then there is these other uh, components to it, but it's all about like development and showcasing what they, you know, what, what they can get. And then a kid, we already had two kids already that work on sport boats that came through the program. And we call them Guppy Rangers, but uh, they didn't have the program yet. But the again, these are like piloting what the vision was at a pace where we were at to show, hey, look, this does work. Mm -hmm. So, And then when you go in the classrooms, you're teaching on a larger scale, right? The Rangers is for the hardcore kid who wants to really get engaged and is passionate about fishing and about the islands and about stewardship. But when you go in the classroom and now you're in front of 30 kids, mm -hmm. how do you keep them engaged? And of course, they're not learning about this other than you, right? That's not part of the, the normal teacher education curriculum. This is a special opportunity that you're, that you're providing them. So I have this gift, honestly. That's why I know I know what I'm supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. I could communicate with kids, man. Like I could go in there and get their attention. This guy that walks in there looking like the rock and kind of buff and has a YouTube channel. And that's what the kids are looking at. Like you grab their attention quickly. Mm -hmm. When I was coaching my son's baseball team and I was doing scouts, I was also doing R and D that I didn't realize at the time. What are they engaged with? Like what's spectating? What's engaging? What's boring? Why are these kids like, what did they like? And what don't they like? So when we do our kid fishing day, let's say on the pier, we take the kids from the school to the pier. We bring crab traps. So they get a chance to pull the crabs up. And think about the fun stuff that you did. I think that's one of the things I like. I don't never really think I grew up. So I remember what was fun for me playing in the creek. But you, that kid thinks it's fun too. Right. So to say, hey, just sit here and hold the fish and pull. Wait for the fish to bite. My grandpa drinks a beer and eat a sandwich. You're going to bore them. Right. So how do you keep them playing with stuff? How do you find rocks and shells and play and discover and adventure and problem solve at the same time with the capacity that they can have a responsibility. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that helps me with that is I give kids that responsibility. You know, like I count on you to get this done. Can you handle it? Yes, Kevin, I can. I'm a sponge. I'm going to soak up whatever you teach me and give me to do. Thank you. How about you? Right. I'm not like telling them. I'm not directing them. Right. I let them explore and get hands on. Plus I'm loud. I'm colorful. I mean, I have a, you know, I do have a personality, but coming in, and setting the tone and saying, this is what we're going to do. When I do my teaching in a classroom, I don't lecture. I'm here to engage in conversation. What's your story? How many of you have been fishing? You get your crowd. And the reason that I think I, again, because I continue to dive into my craft, mm -hmm. I take, I talk real fast. Mm -hmm. So I've taken, um, they probably get mad at me for saying that Toastmaster, right? Hey, I need to, I'm going to be a speaker. What do, what do I do? How do I invest myself? How do I develop my craft? Mm -hmm. So I go back and become a student. So that way, when I get in front of my crowd, I can't stand being in this in a crowd where it's an hour and they're like, oh my God, how long is this going to take? So the things that I've experienced, again, it could be in my, my learning style of being the fidgeter, mm -hmm. like you're going to put me to sleep. So that's how I encapsulate how I teach. Let the kid ask a question. Let you talk. Ask the parent. I think a part of it is just letting them engage versus you just sit there and talk to them. Sometimes I think in school, teachers lecture and on and on. Like, when is she going to stop? Well, Kevin comes in. Again, my style. Right. 
what's up? What are we doing? Now, and maybe not all schools can do that. They got a right. curriculum they got to follow. So I get to come in and break it up. But I think that's how I am successful in a class of 30 and a class of 10 and a class of 50 because I've done it all. I've been out in Simi Valley working with full summer camps. Mm-hmm. And of course, you're not going to get them all. Gonna, I was that kid that you had to yell at. So again, knowing that part, <laughs> I'm empathetic to the kid that he's, those are my favorite. You know, you always have these great gifted kids that always get upped. But the kid is harder to get to like me. Right. People, I've been in those shoes, you know, mm-hmm. I, that's so I think that's where I gravitate because the school say, hey, your story is special. You do this. We need, I think education and the paradigm shift of how we get through to people has also shifted. Mm-hmm. It's not a diagnosis. It's not medication. Ain't Ritalin. He's six. He climbs a tree. You're supposed to. Then you get mad at him because he's in there playing video games. So do you want him climbing a tree or you want him in there with a video game? Right. Which one are you going to do? Kevin's like, hey, which one do you like? Do you like climbing trees or you like, are you an IT nerd? Hey, do what you love. Right. And you've created a, a pretty big, I would say, curriculum for the program. So you've got workbooks and you it's bilingual and it's I and mean, there's a lot going on in terms of what you've distributed to the classroom. Yes, sir. And I think that's, again, because I pour myself into it. I don't know many nonprofits. So you got, we have the for-profit side, right? The vision of of uh, Rolling Air Fishing Show and get average Joes and James to fish. And then you have the real guppy outdoor side. Um, I, I, I like storytelling, you know, and teaching. So the things that I liked... But without getting off course on that thought is that I remember I loved highlights for children that my grandma got me. I remember Mad Libs that we did in school that I loved. So I incorporated those things into the way that I create our workbooks. Mm-hmm. So it's educational. There's a little bit of game. And again, networking and collaborative efforts is putting my guard down to tell the creator, hey, here's my vision and my idea. Can you help me construct this thing? Mm-hmm. And then that letting them come in to help me so that I don't say I'm doing it all. I know that if I need this resource... I'm going to, I'm going to, I know where to find that. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what we show through the Guppy Ranger program. So mm-hmm. these things that have helped me be successful to get to the books and open this facility, I just kind of tie back into my teaching and through the Guppy Ranger or through a school. And I think that's another reason why the school, even though we have the fishing, if you read the testimonials on the wall and then the reports that we get, it's way more than fishing, man. They say, Kevin, whatever, where Kevin's in his team. And that's another thing. Shout out real quick, looking at the camera. I have an amazing team. Marshall, the guys, I couldn't ask for five better guys that I say, Hey, guess what? We're going to do schools every Wednesday. And they're like, Oh, well, luckily we're retired. And I, that's where God gave me the team I needed when it was time for this. If I would have tried to do this five years ago and I was an exterminator, I did not have the team. Sure. I might have had enough fishing poles to do it, but not the, 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 the tremendous resource and support that I have. And each of our volunteers, you know, this is different from the book. They get a kick out of it. Some about watching them teach and watching them like it, it just, you got to see it maybe, but the way our team works on the pier and we feed off of each other and making sure, and that's again, testimonial that you could see all over our Facebook is that we have a culture of servant. Mm-hmm. I think the thing is because we serve first mm-hmm. and we have that culture of all of our guys, no matter where you're at, who's Rod Snap. But now that we do play a game on the pier when we're fishing, uh, I'm team Kev, you have team Vic, no fish Vic, you have team Marshall. No Uffle fish Dick. Vic? Yeah, no fish Vic. <laughs> that's his nickname because he can't fish. He, he does all right, but that's just his name. Even the kids, like, where's no fish Vic? So we even like have characters in our in our organization mm-hmm. that 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 the uh, that our volunteer, I mean, that the kids and participants look forward to seeing at our kid fishing days. You know, where's no fish Vic? He knows how to pull the crab net. He loves to pull it. And it's just, I think we all just feed off of each other's energy, but knowing that we're here to serve and that in in the way that we fish, we all know what we love out of fishing, and it's not. The expensive gear, it's not all that. It's just something we call it vitamin C about mm-hmm. being on the water, that therapy. Mm-hmm. And we just want to extend that, you know? That's awesome. And in terms of the environmental stewardship and recycling, I mean, you're 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 teaching that too. You might take an old rod and oh and yeah. teach the kids how to make it new again. So the rebuild program, again, that's some of mine. You know, I won't go into my whole story now if you want to share it. Somehow, you know, I come up for a broken home and single mom and, you know, all those stories that, you know, you hear a lot of those types of stories. So I used to put a lot of, again, that's why I'm where I'm at as far as development, because I fed myself enough poison growing up that I had to unwire that, had to rewire my brain into thinking how useful, like, can I be? I come from a broken home, poor, homeless, we live in shelters, poor Kev, right? Mm -hmm. Versus, well, if I get developed, again, this is that development thing, I could still be useful. Mm -hmm. So the rod building program, the rebuild program has that, where you take a rod that has a couple of broken tips. You fix it. You put your own unique in this. And what colors do you want to put? You're a Dodger fan. One kid put Laker colors in it. So it's your own unique identity. And then you can go be purposeful again on the pair and still be of use. So I'm even tying some of my story into this development project 
and boom. And then, so networking, right? Let's jump into that. So the stuff that we got from Mudhole, when I go to the big fishing summits- And Mudhole is what? Mudhole, they give us the gear, sorry, I'm pointing like you can, like the viewer can see it, sorry. Mudhole, they have all the rod building equipment that we need, the little yarn and the spinners and stuff we put on the tables. They give us about a 50% discount on the gear that we have. And that's from taking the things we talk about networking across to these summits and these these expos um, like iCast, mm -hmm. expanding them to the brand that we have and then them falling in love with what we're doing and servicing and getting more new anglers out and the concepts that we're taking again, just fishing mm -hmm. and expanding. Because I'm telling you, man, if you talk to people about fi air, people that fish and go outdoors or something inside of us that mm -hmm. just really, again, it was the hunter gatherer instinct that we have, but something that you remember those memories. That's why our first book is called Catch a Memory and not Catch a Monster because there's memories and somebody that the smell of the creek are playing in this. When we start telling them what we do as a brand and as a, the nonprofit, how the, my story and the, and the filming captures all this, oh man, let's partner. You know, mm -hmm. we've had really successful partnerships on that because again, it's not always about that. It's how do we, how do we also, again, when I said I'm part of the recreational fishing community first, mm -hmm. how do we continue to keep our industry afloat? You know, how do we keep on expanding to the next generation? So um, you, we, that's why I call it community Kev because I'm either in the fishing community I'm in our community. I'm in the networking community. I'm on the ocean. I work with NOAA and, and the fisheries management community mm -hmm. because all of these things circulate around this one little thing of recreational fishing. And I and so speaking of the future, what 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 is the future for Real Anguish Network and and the Guppy Program? The future is it's funny. I'm like the modern day Teddy Ruxpin. I say that you know because our books that we have now that things are digital, mm -hmm. we put our videos into the book so the kids can watch my read our book or go through it. And then watch the YouTube video. So I think right now the, the future of it is to continue to like to start touring more. Um, I'm a, I just got with Bass Pro Shop last year, no Barnes and Noble, no taking these books and the educational piece of it, mm -hmm. but taking me along. People really want to hear my story. They like the different aspects that we bring to it. Mm -hmm. So I think the future of what we're doing, we they're going to possibly take this area and develop it. And if we get a studio in here, we want to have like an in-house studio, like you have your camera set up so that we could film. We already have our podcast stuff in there. So how do we take this, this new digital um, era that we're in mm -hmm. and then combine it together? And we're doing it together, like I said, through the books and some of the stuff we do now. The pandemic and going through Zoom and digital really was a game changer for us. And if we didn't have this concept or proof of concept or development where we're at, we'd be scrambling. But since we kind of kept pace and kept moving on to it, that we can use these tools now to expand and again it's and it's not always the fishing it is you know right now i think america and i know this is a long answer but the way that we are shifting culturally and stuff for us to be in this space for education mm -hmm. learning for people to go back to you know this is america the land of opportunity and dreams mm -hmm. i think people quit dreaming for a while and they went to work mm -hmm. where we're back at a place now me and you are in a networking group where entrepreneurship is on the rise again living the American dream, taking care of your family, spending time with your family after the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So we're in an era where we could take this with all we built from all those angles, take it on the road, man. And plus, uh, out of our new studio, maybe some touch tanks in here. So it's more of an educational center. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is what I tell people. This right here is like grandma's demos. You ever see rappers and they're in their grandma's basement making demos <laughs> and pass them out on a little cassette. So that way one day, maybe some big producer will hear them. Right. And then they come in and say, Hey, uh, we love what you're doing. This is raw talent. Why don't we, uh, make you a deal, but we're teaching ownership. So even though these are our demos, when we come to the table to negotiate, we already got a brand mm -hmm. where we can redevelop the game where you don't have to own, I don't have to sign to anybody. We already created enough that we could can, that we can collaborate. So somebody could replicate what you're, what you're doing in a way, uh, uh, they still have to have personality. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know. Maybe I, this is what I tell people to replicate. What do you love doing with your passion? Mm -hmm. Replicate that. Don't replicate Kevin. You know, this is what I do. Right. What would you do? If you were a baker, mm -hmm. replicate that. I want to be a great baker and I want to serve and do that. That's what I teach. Mm -hmm. Not so much what we do in today's society. Where you, there's, 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 you don't want to expose yourself to too much of a liability. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be super gigantic and huge. You can do it at a scale that you feel like you're making impact without duplicating, duplicating, duplicating. Mm -hmm. And that's for everybody's individual. For myself, I like, you know, if I could just be the, I'm, I call myself the California bear and I got these little bears all over. If I could just be regional in California and just, that's just kind of my territory. Mm -hmm. I'm fine with that. You know, to replicate, I could come to you, I can come through video to you, you know, and that's Bass Pro Shops wants to send me all their little Bass Pro Shops or Barnes and Nobody little book signings and stuff. I'm up for that. But you know, about replicating what I do, I'm, I'm, I think, uh, you stay true to yourself and 
that's that's my advice. You know, I wouldn't try to get replicated. Good advice. What do you want folks to know about Kevin and what the mission is and the vision? I would say something I used to, you know, I hear on some of the guys that I listen to and, and speakers is if I can do it, you can do it. Give it a try. That's, I think, the best thing you know that you could cut. Me and this guy were talking at the gym the other day. We're talking about getting it out of the mud. So that's like a little term, more urban, meaning that you got it or out of the gutter, meaning that you did it yourself. Mm-hmm. Nothing was handed to you. You had to go get it yourself. And again, America, man, this is where people come from. All I love being an American. Mm-hmm. You know, take that from Kev. Because you do have opportunity here. No matter what generation you came from, no matter what you did, generational curses, first time generation, what which um, you know, what your ethnicity is, that you can do it. And if you have a chance to encourage other people, if you're getting something from it from Kevin, do it. Mm-hmm. You know, if if your child or yourself or somebody you know has a vision and idea, I tell kids like this, man, go start a lemonade stand this weekend. See what it feels like to start have your own money in your pocket. You get to dress the way you want to dress. You get to work your own hours and see what that feels like to own a little something. You know, mm-hmm. I don't care. Go collect cans for a day. Jump in the track. I did it. Get in there and get grimy, get dirty and see what that feels like when you put some money in your own pocket and then utilize that to start your wills in your brain thinking of what you can do on your own. Mm-hmm. And I think once people start to, that's what helped me. Again, coming from my story of, of looking at myself less than, having an inferiority complex that was off the hook, having a chip on my shoulder, using all those crutches and excuses versus taking responsibility and ownership and start asking for help. Hey, man, I got a, I got a problem with this. Just like somebody on a boat. Hey, I, I can't tie this hook. I can't beat this this uh, hook. I can't. This anchovy won't stop moving. I'm trying to. Now, again, that's just a small metaphor. Sure. But if you just look at things from that small of a detail and go from there, that's what helped me get to where we're at. Is I had a mentor calling me right now. And I remember I was so raw. He told me, Shh, be quiet in a meeting. And I was like, man, have you ever told me to be quiet? Because I was so hardened, man, and so raw. So if that's something that you could take from me, no matter where you come from, how hardened you might be or or stubborn, let go a little bit, man. Get a little bit of help. And if you have a vision or a dream or something that you want to do, start planting seeds, man. Awesome advice, man. How's that? Kevin? Thank you. And yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Farm Talk. And we, of course, want to thank our sponsor, Opus Escrow. And be sure to tune in next time. <laughs>